Good evening. My name is Aaron Bastani and welcome to Tiski Cell. Over the next hour, we'll be bringing you the biggest stories that matter. Tonight, I have the pleasure of being joined by Harriet Prothero Sultani. Harriet, I trust you're well. Oh, I'm well. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> How's life in Wales? Is it, is it extra sunny up there today? Apparently so, which your camera people will take in the, the mick out of. <laughs> It's a nice problem to have. It's not going to stay with us for much longer, I fear. We've yeah. got a lot to talk about, and it's it's relating actually to deteriorating weather, winter, energy. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that. From October, the average household can now expect to pay over £3,500 per year for energy. That's because today, Ofgem have raised energy price caps again, substantially more than many of the predictions we've seen in the last few weeks. This new figure, over £3,500 per year, is an 80% increase on the April cap of almost £2,000 per year, and it's almost three times as much as we were paying in October last year. It's completely out of control, and it's set to get even worse. Ofgem has warned that prices will continue to rise throughout next year. In January, the current prediction is that the average household bill will rise to nearly £5,500 thousand pounds per year and then it'll jump again in April 2023 to over six and a half thousand pounds. That's more than five times what we were paying in October last year. We should say that not everybody will be paying this amount in October. If you're in a single or small than average household, you'll pay less. And if you're in a bigger household, you can pay more, but you can still expect your bills to go up by the same proportion, whoever you are. If you're in a larger house, like I say, things aren't great but we're all going to suffer. The Joseph Rowentree Foundation has released a report that's worth showing you precisely for this reason. This graph shows how much bills are going to be as a proportion of household income after housing costs have been paid. Low-income households will spend four and a half times more for energy next year than they paid last year, and it's pretty much the same for pensioners. Couples with children will see their bills go up from, will go from taking up 10% of their income to nearly 40% of it next year. It's worse for single parents, shooting from 15% to 60% of their income. For couples without children, it goes from about 15% last year to more than 60% next year. But for singles without children, it's a disaster. Bills will be around 115% of their income next year. That means they'll have nothing for food, transport, and they'll be sinking into debt. But yeah, of course, it's the avocado toast and poor mindset that keeps you poor. The foundation's chief analyst, Peter Matajic, said this. The government devised a support package based on a previous energy price forecast made obsolete by today's extraordinary announcement. With the price cap very likely to increase significantly and forecasts remain high well throughout next year, our analysis shows it is a sheer fantasy to think struggling families can pay these stratospheric energy bills without further government intervention on a significant scale. In all my years as an analyst, I haven't double-checked a piece of analysis as much as this one because it is so staggering. It feels incorrect. It is impossible to think a care worker or a shop assistant will have to scramble to find hundreds more pounds to pay for their heating or that the entirety of someone's income for a whole year will be less than their energy bill. But that's what these figures suggest will be the case unless significant further steps are taken quickly. On top of that, Citizens Advice have today announced that they're already seeing two people per minute who need help with their rising fuel bills. Luckily, we have a crack squad of geniuses in government working around the clock to help us out, though none of them were prepared to be interviewed on any of the morning news programs. Instead, we got this pre-recorded statement from Chancellor Nadim Zahawi. The reality is that we should all look at our energy consumption it is a difficult time. There is war on our continent. Very few people anticipated war. Wars happen in far-flung places. It is now here with us. We have to remain resilient. My responsibility is to deliver that help, that £400 that's coming, all the other help that I've just uh, talked you through. But then also, equally important, is I make sure there's more help for those families, for those businesses, throughout next year, because this thing you know, is not going away. We have to continue to support Ukraine, and we are determined to face down Putin. And part of that is helping those vulnerable families. Is that it? We should all look at our energy consumption. Yeah, I think we figured that one out 
pretty long time ago, that the Tories have done almost nothing to help people reduce their individual consumption. They even scrapped the Green Deal that aimed to help households make their homes more energy efficient. But also, freezing to death is playing your part in the war effort against Putin. Is it a case of keep cold and carry on? Boris Johnson also came out of hiding to talk, again, not live, about the cap rise. Well, of course, we could uh, see this coming, and that's why we've uh, put the, the steps in place that we, we already have. And don't forget that uh, although there will be more uh, announcements next month, more cash coming uh, from September onwards, you shouldn't forget that the, the pipeline uh, of cash uh, stretches out uh, throughout the autumn. Uh, so uh, there's going to be another £650 uh, coming for every uh, 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 one of the 8 million most vulnerable households in October. Uh, in November, another £300 to help every pensioner, £150 extra uh, for everybody uh, who uh, is entitled to, to dis disability benefits on top of what we're doing with uh, universal credit and uh, the living wage, lifting both of those up. And so cash, there's a, there's a pipeline of cash coming through over the next few months and uh, through the, uh, the autumn and the, the winter. But that is clearly now going to be augmented, increased by extra cash that the government is plainly going to be announcing in September. All those figures he's listing there, that was put in place in April. Absolutely nothing has changed since then, even though everybody has known about this big new rise for months. And he seems to be promising more cash from whoever takes the lead on the next government, whoever takes over from him, most probably Liz Truss. But neither she nor Rishi Sunak have made any serious spending commitments. In fact, they've said virtually nothing of substance about the single biggest issue facing us all today. This is real Tory death cult stuff. Three power-hungry egoists, too busy scheming for the top spot to provide any meaningful reassurance to a terrified country. Harriet, am I being unfair? Do you, do you have maybe some trust in Liz Truss or Boris or Rishi to get us out of this hole? And if so, who? Um, no, you're not being over the top at all. Uh, they've left us in a really dark and dismal position, to be honest, Siren. But I kind of want to rewind a little bit, because if you're a little bit tough like me, I didn't really know what an energy cap was until I started Googling it. So I'm just going to explain. It's the default tariff. It's like the minimum. You can go above that. So your price could go up and above these already astronomical figures that have been stated. Um, and also, this cap is based on your typical consumption. Now, my first question is, what is typical consumption? In the small print of a lot of these contracts, it says that your averages may vary according to region, which I think actually poses us a really interesting question, Aaron, as to whether in regional local authorities or in devolved governments, there could be the potential to bring down regional averages. This is something that probably needs to be looked into. And the, the government offer is an absolute joke. Um, through December to March, they're offering about £67 off your bill. Now, if your bill is an average of £300, that's still £233 a month. For example, from March to May, I paid £81. So this is an astronomical leap. And what makes my blood boil about all of this is the complete lack of forward planning and I feel like it's so calculated on behalf of the government. Liz, Tr Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak are not doing any media this morning, probably because they're trying to run around and cook up a policy, which either shows, you know, a lack of foresight or actually calculation. Now, maybe I'm living in some parallel universe, right, where this isn't a surprise. Because it's not like this cap was ever going to be affordable. So it's not like some fluke that they don't have a plan unless they're really, really thick. They're waiting to be pushed into a position where they have no option other than to take mass radical action. It's like the furlough all over again. Mass, you know, COVID type rollout of support um, and measures are absolutely unavoidable at this stage. But we're currently trapped in this performative ignorance. We've become like pawns to Tory pride about when they're going to cave to this, you know, thing coming down the track that is totally unavoidable at this uh, at this point. And Liz Truss has already said to us the, um, things like tax cuts are not handouts. 
This is absolutely nuts. She's really trapped herself here as well. Because it's not, you know, those terrible working class people who are draining our lovely Tory economy, but also the middle classes will struggle. So she can't bring a means tested solution in without screwing over her middle class electorate. Also, businesses won't have an energy cap. So what are they going to do? Allow businesses to go under? It's not very Tory. Um, on Zahawi, before I finish, want to come in on Zahawi. Very interesting character. Uh, one which we should probably do a lot more research into. So, you know, he's Kurdish and there's a really big Kurdish community in Cardiff and I spoke to a lot of friends about him and they were saying to me, you know, you really need to look into this guy. This guy is suspect. So I did. And it turns out that he um, banked 1.3 million from an oil company whilst working as an MP and was able to keep those second earnings due to a loophole in parliament. He um, was involved in an oil company called Gulf Keystone, which is an oil feed in, uh, field in Kurdistan, which paid him more than £1,000 an hour. So, you know, if the UK is looking for more oil, it sounds like we need to be tapping up Sahawi because he sounds like he's got a lot of it. The, the corruption around this, this story is all covered in the mirror. So just like give it a quick Google and real. So for him to be telling us we need to worry about our consumption is pretty ironic. Yeah, I always have the image of Nadim Zahawi as a kind of, you know, late 90s nightclub owner. Uh, but the <laughs> idea of him as a, a freewheeling oil dealer in West Asia uh, fits pretty well. And like you say, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be a waste of his talents. He'd be doing a damn sight uh, more that is useful for the, for the British public than what he's doing right now as Chancellor. In any case, we've heard from the Tories. Let's see what the opposition have to say. Just a quick reminder. Labour have proposed freezing the price cap at the current level for the next six months, meaning that no household would see a rise in energy bills between now and April. What happens after April is an open question, but it would definitely make a big difference over the winter, and that's what counts. Labour say it would cost £29 billion, which they would give to the energy retailers to make up the difference between wholesale energy costs and the amount they're allowed to charge on bills. A BBC Breakfast spoke to Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves. There is higher energy consumption in the winter. Um, and the charity Full Fat, and I know you said you've worked with various organisations to cost this your way, but the charity Full Fat has said that your proposals fall £5 billion pounds short. The, uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies puts your shortfall at £8 billion pounds, um, because of the higher impact of the impact of higher prices in the winter. Well, full fact, last time they fact-checked uh, Labour analysis, they had to withdraw their statement a couple of days later. So I would take that with a pinch of salt. Institute uh, for Fiscal our package Studies. Is, our, our package is worth £29 billion. Pounds, and we would pay for that in, in three ways. Let me set that out. Uh, first of all, an increase in the windfall tax, backdating the windfall tax on oil and gas companies to January this year and getting rid of the investment allowances that would see um, around £4 billion pounds paid back to oil and gas companies to support investment, uh, that would raise £8 billion. Pounds. We would repurpose the money the government has already announced, £14 billion, pounds, uh, to, uh, to fund the price cap. Uh, and thirdly, our package of measures would directly reduce uh, inflation uh, because of the contribution that energy prices make to inflation. And as a result, the but debt interest uh, paid on government debt would be reduced by around £7 yeah. billion pounds it's a temporary, these winter it's a months. temporary relief on inflation though, isn't it? Because although you have a cap for six months, the prices are rising. So as soon as yes, that cap leaves, then inflation is fueled again. It's just delaying the um, fueling of inflation. Well, this is a six-month package and, and this is fully costed over those six months. Now, look, when we get to April next year, we don't know where energy prices um, are going to be. That's why we came up with a six-month package, because there is now pretty um, certainty about where energy prices are going to be over the next six months. When we get to April, of course, we will look again at where energy prices are. I think Labour have shown uh, very clearly whose side we are on. It'll be interesting to see whether Labour have got their figures exactly right, but it doesn't matter that much since theirs the, is the only solid plan on the table. It can always be iterated and improved, and it's the one that could make a real difference immediately. This new statesman graph, based on Resolution Foundation research, shows how much each of Labour's, Sunak's, and Trust's plans would impact different households classed by income. Labour's plan gives households around £1,000 this winter. It's not perfect, 
The rich, richest households end up with a lot more than the poorest, but means testing might make it more expensive overall and slow the rollout. Now compare that to the two Tory leadership candidates. Sunak's plan gives £400 to every household, plus more for the poorest. It has the right shape. The poorest households get much more than the richest, who hardly get anything, which makes sense. But in the end, nobody gets very much at all, with poor households getting half of what they would get under Labour's plan. And Truss's proposal? She just plans to reverse April's national insurance rise and suspend green levies. That means the richest households are set to gain nearly a grand, while the poorest would get just £92 against their out-of-control energy bills. Harriet, should we give credit to Labour for at least having a plan on the table that will make a major difference to people over the winter? You know, to be honest, Aaron, this isn't a bad package overall. Um, and I'm going to give credit. That interview was actually not a bad interview as well, trying to answer some of these, you know, big questions. If I'd listened to that without any political knowledge, I think I would actually have found that beneficial. Um, and, you know, the things that Labour are proposing, as was outlined there, uh, freeze the energy cap through the windfall tax, roll out home insulation through a national upgrade plan, invest in uh, sustainable wind, tidal and solar energy. These are all positive things. And I think also it kind of shows looking at this issue in a broader context, which the Tories are refusing to do, which is the life of working class people and how we help ameliorate that in the long term. Things like home insulation, it's not just the immediate impact of the gas and fuel prices, but also a wider and longer term plan. In terms of the graphs, I don't get those graphs. I don't know why. <laughs> Labour would just not de decrease the amount according to income and the highest incomes. I don't want to make myself look stupid, but I legit don't get it. Other than that, maybe it's a political strategy not to annoy higher income earners. Aaron, what do you think? Like, I need this explaining to me. Yeah, so it's, it's not means tested. That's the point, right? So it's a universal intervention and it's not tailored to help the poorest the most. And that means two things, really. I suppose that is the counter argument, Harriet, which is, well, look, you're giving slightly more to higher income people, but it means you can act decisively and you can act across across the board. And realistically, this is quite a rare moment where between rising interest rates, between five quarters of recession, between rising energy and food prices, you know, 60, 70 percent of the public is really going to struggle this year. And so I think there is a really strong argument for universalism and a universal intervention with no means testing. But like you say, it is going to have some strange consequences. Not, not outrageous, but it's clearly not preferable to be giving slightly more to the wealthiest than to the poorest. I think personally, it's probably better than means testing, which would take longer, have more bureaucracy. And realistically, it's going to generate a lot of goodwill and, and solidarity. Harriet, what did you think about the, um, the line from Rachel Reeves about how full fact hadn't necessarily got things right. I couldn't help but think if that was done under Corbyn, if that was John McDonnell on the BBC saying, I don't think full fact have got this right, you know, we would have had the usual suspects on Twitter go, John McDonnell calls full fact fake news. Uh, but it seems to really pass without any, any mention with Rachel Reeves. Why do you think that is? It's like um, fictional or factual postmodernism, you know, it doesn't, facts don't matter. It's all a, a grand narrative that they're constructing around themselves. It only matters when it's your opposition or your enemy. So <laughs> that's probably why they can get away with it. Do you know what? I watched this program on Channel 4 called Undeclared Truth recently, which was really good. And on that, it kind of like clicked in my brain, Aaron, that a lot of these political projects, particularly in America with Trump, et cetera, just completely ignore the facts to their own benefit to their own constructive narrative and labor is a master class in that because as you say when it was corbyn john mcdonald etc they come down on you like, like a ton of bricks but in this instance it's like oh it doesn't matter we'll just pretend it didn't happen <laughs> martin lewis is a man increasingly approaching the end of his tether for months he's been making clear what today's price hike will mean for ordinary people and that's without even mentioning what will happen next year He's cajoled, he's raged, he's made every argument, but the government just doesn't seem to care. On the BBC, he took things to the next level. We'd known it was going to be around £3,500 for a good couple of months or somewhere in that ballpark. And what is shocking, both for the damage that it causes people's mental health, but also for the, 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 the 
the politics of the fact. Last time we had the price cap announcement, we had the plan in place to help people before it was announced. This time, that isn't happening. This time, you know, we were told in May we had a prediction. This time, there's no help in place today. We're being told we have to wait. And I am seeing such terrible panic out there from people saying, how will I afford to pay my bills? And you have Ofchem calling for more government intervention. You have businesses calling for more government intervention. You have the energy trade bodies calling for more public intervention. You have consumer groups calling for more public intervention. I am begging and praying and pleading that there is more government help for this winter so that people will not, and the poorest, and this is not catastrophizing. It is a catastrophe that people will not die because of this this winter. And we need to know now what extra help will come in? Because remember, the government announced help in May based on a price cap from October until April of, th of £2,800. Well, we now know in October it's £3,549 for somebody on typical use. And in January, it's currently predicted to go up to around £5,300 for someone on typical use because we now have a three-monthly change in price cap. That should never have changed, but it has changed. And that January prediction, we are seven months through the 10-month assessment period. So that is pretty robust. It won't be exactly that, but it will be in that ballpark. We don't know from April onwards, but for the January one, we're pretty certain. So we are thousands of pounds short for the most vulnerable of money just to enable them to survive through this energy crisis. And I pray that the new prime minister, when they come in, and we should have heard this earlier, but we're not there now, that they put proper help in place for the most vulnerable. That is such a powerful line. This is not catastrophizing. This is a catastrophe. Harriet, where does Martin Lewis go next because the government clearly isn't listening. To be honest, I'm a bit worried for this guy. He he looks like he's going to go off the edge pretty soon. He looks really mm. stressed. And, and I mean, I don't blame him. His career is trying to help people save money and, you know, make those, those differences in their lives against a really awful system that we live in. Um, and, yeah, he's doing the best that he can. But you know what I think is really interesting? I I actually Googled him because before I just knew him as the guy that like helped you transfer your credit card debt. And now suddenly he's become leader of the opposition. So I Googled him. I was like, what, what's this guy about? And his estimated personal worth is actually 123 million. I was pretty shocked by that. But, you know, I don't say this to ridicule him. He makes a fair point and he's, he's singing the cause for us. Um, and, you know, He's doing a good job, but also I think it's interesting that we're hearing from him and there are a considerable amount of people that we never hear from. And that is a layer of British society that we really, really hear from who live on the bread line. And they're kind of hidden behind this mirage of acceptability in British culture, which means that many folk carry on as if austerity had been nothing but deadly. And you know what? If someone did go onto the television in those news shows that he does, and explain their experiences and explain what they're living through and explain in the sacrifices that they're making, they'd probably be mocked as being either thick or a chav or someone that makes bad lifestyle choices. Now, when we don't hear from those people who are most affected, the middle classes can close their ears and keep voting Tory and pretend nothing that's happening. And I think more broadly, the government doesn't understand what this experience is, le is like. So not only do we not hear the voices and they're really hidden from our public media, but also now in terms of the fact that so many people will be pushed in further and further into the poverty this year, the government has no clue what that's like. They will have no clue what it's going to be like to suffer this winter. I don't have children, right? But imagine being a parent this winter who has to watch their child shivering and crying because they're so cold. Liz Truss, meanwhile, would be swanning around the streets of London on the front pages of the Times in some disgusting fashionable outfit, wanting to, you know, show off how much money she has through her clothes. Apparently she's really into fashion, whatever. It doesn't look like it. Um, and also my really pathetic gripe with Liz Truss is what happened to her voice, Aaron? One, she's definitely gone to like the same voice coach that Thatcher had. Because one minute she was like, pork farms. Next thing, now she's doing these hustings. We're like, no, I really think that well, it just really winds me up every time I hear the change in her voice. 
Well, they do get the coaching, but it's a really good point. It's a really good point, Harriet, that the only person who has sufficient credibility, credibility to talk about millions entering fuel poverty this winter, which is what is about to happen, is worth more than 100 million pounds. And it's like, well, if you're, not, if you're not worth that much, then you're not worth listening to. It's like, no, the whole, the whole essence of this conversation is that people without are going to really struggle. It's a pretty bad news day when it comes to energy prices. They're going through the roof and the government is missing in action. But it's not all doom and gloom because some people are fighting back. The Good Law Project have announced they're planning to sue the energy regulator Ofgem over the price cap rise. And here's why. We think Ofgem can and should be doing more to protect people, especially the most vulnerable. Before raising the cap, we believe Ofgem is legally required to, one, provide evidence it has carried out a proper impact assessment, two, consider appropriate mitigation measures for the most vulnerable, including a lower social tariff. In July, we wrote to Ofgem to express our concern about its decision making. We asked it to provide proof of its impact assessments. It failed to produce any such evidence. Last week, we put the regulator on notice of formal legal action if it failed to uphold its duties. Today's announcement provides no indication that an impact assessment has been carried out. The core of the Good Law Project's case is that Ofgem haven't been properly meeting their duty to protect consumers from the impact of price rises, which includes disabled, elderly, and otherwise vulnerable consumers. And there is some good evidence in favour of their claim. Christine Farnish was a non-executive director of Ofgem for nearly seven years until she resigned earlier this month. She explained to the Times why she quit. I resigned from the Ofgem board because I could not support a key decision to recover additional supply costs from consumer bills this winter. The Times had more on Farnish here. She said she believed that the move would add several hundred pounds to everyone's bill in order to support a number of suppliers in the coming months. Farnish, a former chairwoman of Consumer Focus, acknowledged that decisions over the price cap were never easy and that Ofgem had to weigh up a number of factors such as the sustainability of the market, the likelihood of supplier exits and the costs associated with that and the impact on consumer energy bills. But she said Ofgem's board was charged with an overarching legal duty to protect the interests of consumers. So according to Farnish, Ofgem's decision is less about protecting customers and more about keeping the energy retail market lively. So some people are pursuing a legal route against the cap rises, but others are going in for a more direct action approach. Enough is Enough is a campaign group committed to fighting the cost of living crisis. It involves union leaders, Mick Lynch, Dave Ward, and Eddie Dempsey, as well as left Labour MPs like Zara Sultana and Ian Byrne. And now Manchester Mayor and former Labour MP Andy Burnham appears to have come on side too. In response to the latest energy cap rise, Enough is Enough released this call to action on social media. It's just been confirmed. Energy bills will rise to £3,549 in October. This will be the biggest attack on living standards in decades. We're declaring a national day of action on October the 1st with protests across Britain. Join us. We say enough.co.uk. Enough is enough. Another campaign group fighting impossible energy bills is Don't Pay UK. They're asking people to pledge to stop paying their energy bills from the 1st of October. So far, 120,000 people have signed up. The image you're seeing here is from the demo outside Ofgem offices in London. They called it in response to the rise earlier. The interesting thing about Don't Pay UK is you can tell their campaign will probably prove very effective. Why? Because it has the energy bosses shook. This is what Ofgem CEO Jonathan Brearley said to Radio 4 earlier this month. I know everyone is extremely worried about paying their energy bill, but absolutely I would not encourage anyone to join a campaign like this for two reasons. First of all, it will drive up costs for everyone across the board. Secondly, if you're facing difficulty in paying your bill, the best thing you can do is get in touch with your energy company. I would not encourage anyone to withhold they're paying their bill because that just damages things further and it will impact them personally. Sure, if there were just 10 or a thousand of you refusing to pay, it might affect your credit rating and cause you some trouble and probably not achieve very much. But if there's a million of you? After all, 
Polling suggests that as much as 25% of the public can't or won't pay their energy bills this winter. A million, after all, might just be the beginning. Harriet, does Jonathan really have people's best interests at heart, or were you expecting him to say on Radio 4 that people should stop paying their bills? <laughs> In the words of Mick Lynch, how do you expect me to answer that question? <laughs> of course, I don't trust his motivations. Um, these campaigns are proven to be incredibly powerful. In the beginning, you could see a lot of people on Twitter being really sceptical um, about don't pay in particular. Some of it was absurd, to be honest. But my attitude towards this and a lot of politics is increasingly, screw it, why not? Like, Don't Pay is one of the only shows in town at the moment. Um, and I do kind of understand people's nervousness, though, around not paying bills, particularly if you've had a difficult relationship to debt in the past. If you spent your life surrounded by debt, you might be scared to take actions like these. So I do understand that nervousness. I called a family member earlier and asked them what they thought. Uh, and they said, why would I get myself into more debt and stress? Now, obviously, that's not a broader, longer strategic view. But when it comes to your own personalized debt, I understand the nervousness around it. Um, in terms of enough is enough, fantastic. I signed up straight away. So did thousands and thousands of other people. And I think it's been a really good place for people on the left to put their energy since Labour Party gate, which I'm now going to refer to it as, which was the whole debacle of the Labour Party. Um, I'm a bit gutted because they've called this National Day of Action on the 1st of October, which is when I've organised an independence demonstration in Cardiff. So now we have a major clash. But personal issue, Aaron. <laughs> I mean, actually, on that note, um, uh, Harriet, do you view these kind of economic grievances Obviously, this is just extraordinary, the energy bills one. But as somebody, you're Welsh, I think people watching this have probably noticed that. You're involved in the independence campaign. I mean, I wrote a piece on, on Welsh independence. I interviewed you. You were very useful and helpful, actually, when I came to see you guys in South Wales. How do you think these debates around the cost of living crisis, about energy, about clear misgovernment coming from Westminster... How does that impact the debate around independence? Do you get to say, well, look, your bills are up five grand, but actually... An independent Wales could do this, or a, a Wales with autonomy over energy policy could do this. Is that is that the kind of conversation you're beginning to have amongst the ND movement? I love you for asking this. I was going to shoehorn this <laughs> in somehow, but you've asked me anyway. So, <laughs> well, do you know what? I was sat here the other day and I was thinking how amazing it would be for Wales to have a nationalised, well-showed, renewable energy company. And I started looking into it, and it's actually in the cooperation agreement between Plaid Cymru and Labour at the moment. So. Is work underway towards that. But today, Mark Drakeford tweeted saying something about how disgraceful this was, but how little power the Welsh government had to be able to intervene on this, which is like the cherry on the cake. Okay, I think Mark Drakeford's fantastic, a caveat, right? But okay, Mark Drakeford, you say this, but then you claim that we're better off in the union. How mm. does that logic stand? That is... Uh, it's the same with the NHS, which we can come to later, where continually the Welsh government doesn't have powers to be able to take the necessary and radical interventions that they want to, particularly Mark Drakeford as a left winger, but yet is tied to a union that doesn't want that to happen. And of course, every time issues like this happen, support for independence skyrockets. We, um, we used to see that in the membership of Yes Cymru. Every time there was a big public scandal, the membership would literally shoot up and down. So yeah. Almost certainly this is going to fuel that discussion and bring it on. Let's have it. Yeah, I, I find it sort of interesting, actually, because especially in the context of climate change, Scotland, Wales, lots of land, lots of agricultural land, lots of water, lots of renewable um, you know, capacity, potentially, you know, whether that's wind, whether that's hydroelectric. England is going to be the net importer of food and of water and electricity. I think these really do underscore the arguments for independence. But that's uh, a conversation for another day. Health Secretary Steve Barclay has been confronted by a member of the public on the subject of constantly deteriorating ambulance waiting times. The moment took place outside Moorfield Eye Hospital in London. Let's take a look. Uh, that plan for jobs has protected Are you going to do businesses. anything about the ambulances waiting and yes, the people to. dying out? Well, don't you think 12 years is long enough? Yes, and we are. 12 years, taking... you've done bugger all about it. No. People have died, and all you've done is nothing. 
That's amazing timing, I have to say. If you ever heckle a minister on camera, that's how you do it. In with a clear message, and then you go. 20 seconds, and the camera crew is smiling at each other, thinking, this is dynamite. On the issue of ambulance waiting times, it's an incredibly important point that's being made, however. NHS England has a target of 18 minutes for an ambulance, yet in May, data show that the average wait was 39 minutes and 58 seconds. Data for June indicated that had risen to 51 minutes and 38 seconds. And incredibly, data for August shows that figure is now 59 minutes, 8 seconds. Of course, 51 minutes is just an average and many have to wait far longer. But this isn't recent. Like most things relating to public services in Britain, there's a clear trend since 2010 and when austerity began. When talking about ambulance times, there are multiple categories, but the two most important ones are categories one and two. Category one cases are those that are life-threatening. The person has stopped breathing or is unconscious. In 2010-11, the percentage of category one incidents that received a response within its target of seven minutes was 74.9%. For this class of incident, response times are worse now than they were two years ago. Average times have been climbing since mid-2020, and it's now a full 90 seconds longer than it should be. That's a long time when someone isn't breathing. Category 2 case emergencies are very serious. They include heart attacks, strokes, and major burns. For Category 2 incidents, 91.2% of ambulances arrived within its target 18 minutes in 2010-11. As this image shows, while targets for Category 2 cases were falling away by 2019, poor performance has also rocketed since 2020, and one can presume the COVID pandemic. Far from 18 minutes, the average response time earlier this year was more than an hour. Harriet, this woman hit the nail on the head, didn't she? When it comes to ambulance waiting times, things just get from bad to worse under the Tories. This woman's a legend. I love this woman. Um, I've got a personal anecdote, and he won't mind me telling you this because I spoke to him earlier, but my grandfather recently had a stroke, and the ambulance took three and a half hours to come for him, so that was a Category 2. And then he ended up waiting in A&E for a further three hours on the forecourt. He said to me, it was horrendous. I could write a book about it. He said when he saw the doctor, they said he should have gone straight to the stroke unit instead of um, A&E. And I think what this exemplifies is ambulances are really at the rough end of the care system. And when services up until that point are under so much stress and pressure, then of course people are going to be left until last minute. He gave me the example earlier of when you call, uh, when he calls his local doctor, they say, if you're not breathing, go to A&E, which puts a huge amount of stress on A&E. But because the doctors are overworked, like the system is just so congested everywhere along the system um, are like really bad impacts dramatically. Now, the obvious caveat for everyone Welsh listening is that I don't live in England and this is the, the English stats, but the English NHS. But that raises an interesting question for us, which is if health is devolved, where this kind of deadlock begins, if it's a devolved Labour administration. For example, Plaid and the Tories will say that the matter is devolved and therefore needs ministers you know, to get to work to solve this crisis. Welsh Labour will say that Wales is funded through an ever-decreasing pot of money from Westminster and has little to no ability to raise taxes. They'll say there's simply no money. Now, to be honest, I don't know which one of these is true. All I know is that uh, health is devolved, and if you're stuck having the stroke on the floor for three hours, you're going to get angry, just like that lady. But then the even more interesting question is, Aaron, what I mentioned earlier if let's say the Welsh logic is true, that Westminster doesn't give enough money to Wales and is killing our NHS, excuse the pun, why would that very same party advocate for being better off in the union? Something to think about. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful point. Um, actually, speaking on the on the issue of Wales, um, Harriet, I remember speaking to somebody in, in Brecon over the summer, and I think they were telling me that there's only one hospital now with an a and &E in Powys. Maybe you can correct me on that which I just found absolutely incredible, this, this huge region of Wales. It is really large, and it's just one A&E. And uh, I said, I actually asked about ambulance waiting times. He said, look, people, you just don't bother. You get a taxi or you call, you call a friend or family member. And I thought, wow, in large parts of the country, people are actually giving up on an ambulance service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think it's Neville Hall. I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. And it's coupled with the issue of rural poverty as well. How can you afford a taxi if you're in the... 
that could cost you a lot of money to get miles across the country towards the nearest A&E unit. Meanwhile, it's taking you hours to get there. It's an absolute shambles. BBC impartiality is a famously touchy subject. The corporation is duty-bound to not pick a side on a host of issues, but to simply offer the facts and let the audience judge for themselves. Lord Reith, the first Director General of the BBC, once said its aim was to inform, educate and entertain. What it wouldn't do, however, is tell people what to think. Former Newsnight anchor Emily Maitlis has now attacked her former employer, the BBC, for failing to maintain those high standards it claims to uphold. Speaking at the McTaggart Lecture, Maitlis had this to say about how the BBC responded to complaints from Number 10 regarding her 2020 piece to camera on Dominic Cummings' alleged lockdown breaches. We show our impartiality when we report without fear or favour, when we're not scared to hold power to account, even when it feels uncomfortable to do so, when we understand that if we've covered rule-breaking by a Scottish chief medical officer or an English government scientist, then journalistic rigour should be applied to those who make policy within number 10. The one person, ironically, who understood this was Dominic Cummings himself, who texted me that very evening to offer his wry support. Why had the BBC immediately and publicly sought to confirm the government spokesman's opinion? without any kind of due process. It makes no sense for an organisation that is admirably, famously rigorous about procedure, unless it was perhaps sending a message of reassurance directly to the government itself. Put this in the context of the BBC board, where another active agent of the Conservative Party, a former Downing Street spin doctor and former advisor to BBC rival GB News now sits, acting as the arbiter of BBC impartiality. According to the Financial Times, he's attempted to block the appointment of journalists he considers damaging to government relations, provoking Labour's deputy leader, among others, to call it Tory cronyism at the heart of the BBC. The response from some quarters to that speech was feverish, particularly from people who often call criticism of the BBC conspiracy theories, if it comes from people they don't agree with, particularly on the left. Emily Maitlis is finally free to say what needed saying, said one. The BBC has lost its nerve, declared Gabby Hinchcliffe for The Guardian. Thank you, Emily Maitlis. Speaking the truth in a time of universal deceit is a revolutionary act, cried James O'Brien. Revolutionary! All hell, Emily Maitlis, cried former Remain campaigner Femi Olawule. The fight back begins, concluded former Conservative MP Anna Subri. I thought she was beginning the fight back at Change UK, but there we go. It's important to add that the BBC has denied all of this. A BBC executive has told The Guardian's Jim Watson that in no way did the government prompt the broadcaster to censure Newsnight over that particular incident. Now, I agree with Maitlis that the BBC has repeatedly failed on impartiality. We talk about that a lot on this show. But what I also find interesting is the response she generated. There was no smoking gun in the speech. This was her opinion about her work had been singled out for a political mauling by number 10. That wasn't new, but how BBC management immediately deferred to it, well, that was, she says. Maitlis says at the top of the speech that what is to follow is not a post-BBC ex-employee rant. And yet, it kind of is. In any case, the response she generated, it's fantastic. She's finally found her voice. It's amazing. This is finally being called out. It surprised me. Maybe it shouldn't, but it did. Because what's changed? I'll tell you what. Emily Maitlis no longer earns £350,000 a year at the BBC. Everything Maitlis said in that speech has been public knowledge for years. And Robbie Gibb, who she insinuates is a quote-unquote Tory agent, was head of the BBC's political programme in 2017 before going to work for Prime Minister Theresa May. He had been for years. Was this never an issue before? Or is she now calling into question the entirety of the BBC's political output under Robbie Gibb? Because that's the only coherent conclusion here. I would agree if it is, by the way, but I suspect it isn't. I quickly want to go over some of the BBC's content under Maitlis, which presumably was firmly impartial. Here's Maitlis tweeting about whether Labour should remove then-leader Jeremy Corbyn immediately before an election. Here she is presenting Newsnight with Jeremy Corbyn 
in front of the Kremlin with a rather strange looking hat. Here she is retweeting someone referring to the Corbyn cult, which presumably means the 500,000 Labour members who aren't really legitimate in public life. And finally, here is a clip of Jeremy Corbyn as a CGI Voldemort, which Maitlis introduced as former Labour leader. Well, that was the end of a show. That was how they finished. It was a bit of fun making him look so evil. Harriet, is this a case of Maitlis perhaps not being the best messenger for what is, nevertheless, a very important message? Maitlis is a hypocrite with a posh voice. There's no two ways about it. She's a hypocrite. I don't tend to think of journalists as the most, you know, uh, revolutionary people, uh, especially when they're working for British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, or that they're usually, you know, the man or woman of the people. It really does astonish me, people's lack of self-awareness. Um, and it made me laugh how people can suddenly switch perspective when something suddenly affects them. And yeah, of course, it's an eloquent speech. She's one of the country's most famous journalists. That is usually a prerequisite to be a journalist is the ability to speak. And you know what? She reminds me of my pal's mother who on the um, second referendum uh, demonstration, she posts on Facebook saying, um, I haven't marched for 20 years and now I'm here. And I was thinking, where have you been? We've had over 10 years worth of austerity, the Iraq war. Oh, yeah, no, you just turn up for this demonstration. <clears throat> it just stops with a huge amount of privilege and lack of self-awareness and hypocrisy. But everyone will love it because she's, you know, very eloquent. She's got a lovely posh voice and she's saying really obvious things. Great. Yeah, there was one tweet which really uh, summed this up for me. It made me chuckle too. It was by an at Dejeva who wrote, Emily Maitlis complaining about the lack of BBC impartiality is like the CEO of Thames Water complaining about turds in the River Thames. Sometimes Twitter gets too much for bad press. So I thought that was pretty funny. Harriet, thank you for joining me this evening on uh, Tisky Sow. We got it just in under an hour. You've been fantastic covering some really important stories. Any final words to our wonderful audience? No, it was really, really nice speaking to you guys. And, you know, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been our pleasure. And if you're wondering why we haven't talked about postal workers going on strike so far on tonight's show, that's because we released a video earlier today where I explained the nature of their grievances and why you should support them. You can check that out on our channel. We'll be sure to cover that story a lot more over the coming weeks. After all, today was the first of potentially eight days of strike action by British postal workers. For now, I've been Aaron Bastani filling in for Michael Walker. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night. Thank you.